I welcome you to another session of the Network Seminar Series hosted by the Center for Network Intelligence at the Robert Bosch Center for Cyberphysical Systems, IISC. Today's talk is by Professor Ling Jia Liu, and he would be giving a talk on AI-inspired wireless communications, reservoir computing needs MIMO OFTM. Ling Jia Liu is a professor at, in the Bradley Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Virginia Tech. He is also serving as the Associate Director in Wireless Virginia Tech at Virginia Tech. Prior to joining Virginia Tech, he was an Associate Professor in the ECS Department at the University of Kansas. Before that, he spent four plus years with Mitsubishi Electric Research Lab and Samsung Research America working as a standard delegate in the 3GPP LTE, LTE advanced standard. He was a technical leader within Samsung on downlink MIMO, coordinated multipoint transmission reception, device to device communication and heterogeneous network. Professor Lingia is a senior member of IEEE. He was an editor for the IEEE transactions on wireless communication and IEEE transactions on communications. He's currently serving as an associate editor for IEEE transactions on neural network and learning systems. Professor Lingjia has 200 plus publications, including three book chapters, 90 plus journal articles, five editorials, 100 plus conference papers, and 20 plus granted US patents. His research received many recognitions in the field, including eight best paper awards. Besides academic research, Professor Lingjia also has numerous technical contributions to the 4G standards, including both 3GPP LTE Advanced and IEEE 802.16M. Over to you, Professor Lingjia. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. And uh, like I said, uh, it's my great uh, pleasure and honor to be invited uh, to give a talk here and uh, one of the finest institutions in the world. And also, uh, uh, it's great to see Paramo again after so many years. <laughs> we, uh, we used to work together back in Texas in it. All right, so uh, let's go to my talk. And uh, like uh, uh, I was mentioned in my talk, the title of my talk is AI Inspired Wireless Communications with Our Computing Meets MIMO FDN. And my name is Lin Jaleo. I'm currently a faculty member in uh, uh, Virginia Tech, ECE at Virginia Tech. Wireless at Virginia Tech is one of uh, uh, a group within EC department actually focus on the communication and we have relatively long legacy back to let's say NPRGs. All right, so uh, before I go into the technical discussion, I want to acknowledge and uh, all those collaborators and students and uh, Dr. Yang Cindy is my collaborator back in, uh, in Virginia Tech and uh, John Jojo, John Lianjun, Shashank, Donald and Jare, they are all contributing to uh, various components of this talk. And I would say without them, I mean, nothing can be here and most of the credits should go to them. All right, so if you look at title, right? So the title is AI enabled wireless communication. So let's say, let's look at the first keyword AI and uh, why we want to apply AI for wireless. And uh, since we, wireless is pretty successful using different methods, right? Other methods than AI. So why we want to apply AI? So one of the key motivation from us to look at applying artificial intelligence for wireless communication is due to, let's say, network complexity. And one of the reason is if you look at the network, it's changing from, let's say, 3G, 4G, 5G, the network becomes more and more complex. And uh, you are going to have, let's say, heterogeneous network, and also you have different numerologies, and um, and also the network coordination strategy becomes uh, very complicated, and you are going to have a very diverse nature of end user applications. So in that sense, it's difficult to use, let's say, model based approach to exact model them, and also the net simply because of the network complexity, and we probably want to look at other methods than the model-based approach. So in that sense, AI becomes one approach we can look at it. Another actually, another method, another particular point we want to use AI for wild communication is model deficit. And uh, as you may know, I mean, for traditional communication systems, especially wireless systems, what we do is that we have a very good model, right? Very abstract and nice mathematical model to model the end-to-end, -end, let's say input-output uh, relationship. 
and this model is this model based approach is extremely successful in the past in designing communication systems. However, as you go into let's say um, new regime, especially 4G, 5G, and uh, probably many people know what does 5G, right? I mean, one of the key things associated with 5G is millimeter wave, millimeter wave communication. And in millimeter wave communication, a lot of actually new concept comes in. For example, um, low, I mean, ADC, right? Low resolution ADCs. And now, I mean, if you're looking into those regions and there's a lot of non-linearity of the device components comes in. Right. For example, if you look at ADC, it's clearly introduced something non-linear at the receiver side. And also, if you look at, let's say, power amplify, right, you can actually may easily go to the non-linear region of the power amplify, which, um, which can be difficult to model. So in a sense, in that sense, it's very difficult to analytically model the end-to-end -end behavior in a tractable manner. And in that sense, we can potentially rely on AI, right, machine learning to help us you know, because we don't have a model to start with. All right, the third is actually algorithm deficit. What does that mean? That means in many cases, okay, even in traditional communication systems, I mean, we do have, we have the model, okay? We, we can characterize so-called optimal strategy, let's say maximum likelihood and things like that. And, uh, but they are actually, those strategies can be well characterized. But on the other hand, they are very, very complicated to implement in practice. Right, we know actually, let's say maximum likelihood probably is one of the best receiver, the optimal receiver in certain sense, but in reality, we don't use it. Why? Because it's the complexity is way too high. And also if you are familiar with this broadcast channel, right, you know, dirty people coding at transmitter sites, I mean, can, can, can achieve capacity in certain scenarios, can achieve capacity region, but we don't use it in reality. I mean, we use linear process per coding in the transmitter. Why? Because of the complexity, okay? so. In that sense, optimal strategy is there, but they are too complicated to implement. And in that sense, we can potentially using artificial intelligence. Okay, the reason I'm mentioning this is because we really want to answer the question, why? Why? Is why we want to use AI? Because now, probably at this moment, probably a lot of people understand, think, wow, it's pretty natural, but back to, let's say, three or four years or even five years back, and the first question people is really challenging you is that, why we want to use AI? Everything's we Everything's working, nothing's breaking, all right? So anyway, so these are the, actually some of the aspects we see and AI can help. And we want to focus on those areas, right? Because we, we don't just want to apply AI blindly to any problem. So we want to look at, let's say, problems which traditional method cannot solve, and then we can use AI to help. All right, I hope that makes sense. And then for me, I mean, we want to look at how to apply AI in various layers, right? AI and machine learning has been extensively used, let's say in computer vision, and which shows great promise and great achievement. But if you apply to AI and machine learning to communication systems, we have different domain constraints and domain knowledge, right? It's, we cannot blindly apply it. And also it depends on which layer of the communication network you are going to apply AI and machine learning tools to. So there may be actually different, let's, uh, issues associated with that, and they maybe have different techniques you want to actually factor in. All right, so for me, I'm a physical layer person or physical and Mac layer person. When I was, I mean, I think uh, in the introduction, right, uh, the host mentioned that I was before joining academia, I was actually in the industry, I worked in industry for three and a half years and close to four years. And I was a 3GPP delegate in round one, video access network working group one, which is mainly on the physical and Mac layer. So I think physical and Mac layer are the foundational layer of the wireless network. So that's why we apply AI and ML to that first. So into this particular layer, okay, particular two layers. So what are the main issues? Of course, it's not a network complexity issue, it's mainly the model deficit and algorithm deficit, right? I mean, for example, the non-linearity, think about the non-linearity of device. And also algorithm, right? I mean, it's too complicated to achieve, let's say, maximum likelihood. And then can we do something better? Okay, can we do something, let's say, performance-wise, it's better than the linear processing, linear LMMSC-based approach with actually good performance. All right, so important use case in these two layers, what we can see that, I mean, we can do channel estimation and prediction, I mean, under using supervised learning or we can use actually receive processing and doing symbol detection. And also we can do channel decoding. It's also supervised learning. And on the Mac layer, we can look at actually spectral access, which where reinforcement learning can be used. All right, in this particular talk, we focused on receive processing, which is symbol detection. So, 
All right, so knowing, I mean, seeing, okay, there must be there are the points of uh, having AI, using AI or wireless communication systems, wireless systems, then we also need to know what are the challenges of applying AI, because before we, let's say, go deep into this and we want to know what are the issues, right? It's not actually a solution to solve everything. So there are actually risks associated with using AI. So especially using AI and the ML for communication systems. So the first issue we see is actually a system overhead training issue, okay? So unlike, let's say, communication, uh, unlike computer vision problems, you have a lot of training, right? I mean, you have a lot of training data available to you. Communication system, you really have very little training. And what does that mean? So if you look at, if you teach, if you take a communication class, right, 101, communication 101, and then they are going to define what is communication. The basic problem of communication is reproduce the, the, the message, right, at the other end uh, from, at the, uh, you transmit the message from one end and you want to reproduce it exactly or approximately at the other end. So basically the message is unknown to you, right, at the, at the destination. So if the message is known to you, then it's not carrying any information. So there's uncertainty and of course you go through information theory to characterize what is information. But here the key point is that you sending things which is not known at the receiver. And if you are sending things which is known at the receiver, then it's not information, right? Then that is actually what is training is doing. Training is that you're sending things which is actually not receiver and then you train a neural network. So, so, and the communication purpose is trying to reduce that training. Okay, so want to minimize that because that is called overhead, it's not data. And from the neural network per, per se, you want to actually have significant amount of that so that you can train your neural network well enough or machine learning learn well enough. So, I mean, we foresee this system overhead, which is a train and availability of training data. They are really key. So issues, I mean, applying, preventing from applying AI model to cellular network, or at least you need to address it. Okay, you should not assume the training is there for free. And also you need to consider the training overhead significantly because when I was in 3DPP, the first thing actually we designed, let's say at that time, LT advanced systems trying to cut the overhead, right? I mean, see, if you are familiar with CIS, common reference signals used in LT systems, when they move to LT advanced systems, we change that to CSIIS and DMRs. The purpose is trying to remove, okay, is trying to reduce the overhead of those reference signal, which is the training. All right, another actually, second issue we see is that lack of binding performance. What does that mean? If you're going to smoothly integrate AI into cellular networks, it is crucial to ensure you have a tolerable and a graceful degradation in worst case scenarios, which is provided by model-based approach. But for AI, and especially if your neural network is treated as a black box, then it's very difficult to find out what are the worst case scenarios. Okay, so this is very important. We want to actually characterize what are the worst case scenarios and then give us confidence of applying this method, right, into cellular networks. And the third actually issue we see is that lack of explainability. So it is very good. I mean, we can, it is desire for us to apply AI models to explainability for domain experts. For, for example, for current situation, if you're going to use, let's say, model-based approach, if something happened, as a domain expert comes in, you can explain, oh, this is because, um, let's say, the receipt processing is not doing very well. I mean, with the beamforming, you are not doing egg and beamforming, for example, things like that. And you can explain, right, the SNR and interference, but for AI, it's difficult. Okay, so you can, it's difficult to apply this AI model and then just figure out what is it actually happening and because you are treating them as a black box to some extent. Also, another key thing is uncertainty and generalization. So if you look at the end learning, right, machine learning too, you have learning, you have training, and you have testing to some say. And if you want to make sure the testing has a good performance, for example, for communication system, the, the data, the data symbols, right? And the training symbols. So if the training symbol and data symbol have different features, then you are going to have issue, right? Then you are going to, you are going to have a big issue because then the training cannot be generalized to unseen cases, which is actually the data. So you want to make sure the training and the testing have the data have the same feature. Otherwise you will have big trouble. And unlike let's say computer vision problems, which is kind of stationary and the communication especially a cellular network is changing a very, very dynamic 
uh, phase. So think about LTE systems or LTE device systems, okay? So they're changing on a millisecond based. So scheduling and the modulation coding strategy and the transmission mode and the MIMO operation, everything's done on a subframe basis, which is one millisecond. Okay, that means actually from one millisecond to the next millisecond, it can be completely changed. The interference environment can be changed and the modulation coding strategy can be changed. Okay, so that posed a lot of, let's say, uh, issues or let's say challenge per se. All right, another thing that lack of interoperability, meaning actually you want to make sure the AI modules developed from different vendors can collaborate, can work together and you need to define interface, right? Current model-based approach or set of standards. I mean, you can have let different operators or different, let's say, manufacturers or different uh, device vendors, they will work together. But for AI-based approach, then let's say this is also a big challenge. There's an inconsistency among AI modules. All right, so now knowing actually what are the challenges, we keep these challenges in mind and keep this application in mind. Let's move forward, look at the main dish. So, which is actually symbol detection. So the key motivation of symbol detection, what is motivate? What is symbol detection doing? Symbol detection is easy, okay? That's the basic or one of the basic feature or, um, or function of a communication system is actually I send X, okay? And then I receive Y and uh, X is related, Y is related to X through H, which is a channel, okay? Y can equals to HX or can be equals to something else, okay? So, but what happened is that you receive Y, okay? At, and then you want to know what X is transmitted, right? And uh, usually the traditional current, let's say conventional approach, let's say model-based approach is that you first model what is the relationship between X and Y. Like I said, usually model Y equals to HX plus N, something like that, okay? So you have a model and then what do you need to do is that you first to do the channel estimation, Okay, and then you do the symbol detection. So what does that mean? I'm going to go more details in the next slide. All right, so for my more FDM system, and if you assume everything is ideal, okay, everything is ideal, let's say, the input output relationship will be yi tilde equals to h xi plus ni. So this is assumption. So this is the model we assume, right? Let's say we assume this model. So what we are going to do the first is that we're going to estimate h. So how to estimate h? So we are going to send X I tilde, and then which is known to the receiver, right? The receiver knows what is X tilde, okay? And then based on what you received as Y tilde and X tilde, then you are going to estimate, you are going to figure out what is H. So that is a channel estimation. And you can have various ways to figure out H, let's say V square, linear minimum mean square or estimator, or you can have maximum likelihood, or I mean, all kinds of estimator you can come up. Okay, so that, but the whole purpose is that I want to estimate H from what is known to me, which is X tilde. So this is overhead, you can think about it, right? If you look at the previous slides, there's a resource grid here, sorry, resource grid here, all those are actually resource grid, those resources are sending known signal to receiver, and that is treated as, the system is treated as, as overhead. And because the purpose, I mean, receiver don't need to know H, the end, Go is knowing what is transmitted X for those actual data, right? And uh, the sending known signal is known symbol is trying to assist that process, okay? The, the tra channel estimation process. Once you have an estimate, let's say H hat, okay? This is based on you doing the channel estimation, you figure out H hat, then you send X and Y. X as it's this time now is unknown to you. And then based on H hat, which is estimated and unknown X, and of course, Y, you, you, you saw it, it's at the receiver side, you need to figure out what is transmit signal X hat. Okay, so X hat, you can think about it, the estimate of X. So that's a symbol detection process, conventional way of doing things and the two-step approach, channel estimation and the symbol detection. I hope that makes sense to you. And then the question becomes, what if the world is non-ideal? So what if this model doesn't work and then, well, we still assume it to work. <laughs> we, we make actually strategy based on this, and then we'll see the traditional way that we still assume it work, and then we come up strategy based on this model, and then basically we, we, we look at it in various scenarios when this model does not work, and then that, that's how things go. All right, so alternatively, you can do learning-based approach. Basically, you, can, you don't need to assume 
a particular model between x and y. All right. In that sense, in that case, what you do is that you assume, no, nothing assume, you get y, okay? You know what is uh, x associated with y, right? So you know y is actually a mapping from x, right? y equals to f, fx, all right? So what I can do is that I can create a neural network to learn the reverse mapping, okay, from y to x, because I know y and I know associated x, then I can actually feed this y into a neural network and train the neural network such that it will learn x. Okay, so that makes, I hope that makes sense to you. And in that sense, I don't need to make any assumption between x and y, I just need to know, hey, y is related to x and I want to train the neural network such that I input y, I get x. All right, this is a machine learning based approach, which makes perfect sense. But then the issue is that, I mean, come on, you really need to have a large amount of training data to train the neural network, right? They called, uh, they called uh, yeah, data analytics and uh, large data and things like a big data, right? Those are the actual name associated with that. You need to have a large number of training data. And also you probably, if you don't have a large amount of training data, you really do a lot of offline training, okay? You have a lot of data you know, offline to train, to train the neural network and may hopefully it will make work on, online. But will that work on online? Let's look at it, okay? So let's first look at offline, online versus offline learning. So unlike computer vision problems, like I said, wireless systems are dynamic and it's actually dynamic in the time and the frequency. There are a lot of operation modes in wireless and cellular networks. And also the wireless cellular networks need to change on the fly. Like I was mentioning for LTE, LTE demand systems, it's actually changing on a millisecond basis, on a subframe basis, okay? So you do rank adaptation, you do link adaptation, you do precoding and scheduling, everything is on a subframe basis. So in that sense, if you want to do offline training, good luck, right? I hope you have all the data with you. You have all the, actually the data capture the feature with you. Otherwise it will be challenging, right? And remember the challenge we mentioned the uncertainty in generalization. Okay, so that means if you completely rely on offline training for receive processing, it may be very dangerous, especially under the uncertainty generalization. You want to make sure the testing and training have the same feature, and it's difficult for you to have it because there are so many possibilities there, and it's on a millisecond basis. Okay, and also that means actually it's desirable to have an online learning based receive processing for robust and adaptive transmission. I hope that makes sense to you. So. It will be best if we can do things on a subframe base, right? We just use the training within this subframe and then we do the testing, we do the same computation within that subframe, the same subframe, okay? So I assume they have similar features, okay? So that is a complete rely on online. Okay, so now let's look at actually the, what are the neural networks? I mean, deciding what are the features, I mean, what are the problems, uh, challenges we have, then let's look at what are the neural networks we should look at. So. It is actually natural to use a recurrent neural network because of the re recurrent nature. That time dynamic system, it has a temporal correlation and it's, it's good to take advantage of that temporal correlation using recurrent neural network. Okay, however, training recurrent neural network is very challenging. And also there are some major issues. Other than that, there are other major issues associated with MIMORPHDM. The first is that over the air training is limited. If we are going to do an online based approach, then, like I said, the, the, the training is very limited. You want to reduce the number of training. But on the other hand, if it's reduced too much, then you cannot learn it very well. So, but on the other hand, if you are going to, if you are going to compare the machine learning based approach, you need to compare with a traditional approach, which has their training, right? Their actual reference signal usually is less than, let's say, 15% of the overhead. The overhead is usually less than 15%. Of course, it depends on number of antennas. It can go up to 20. But I mean, if you actually showing a neural network based approach, you use much, much higher training overhead and showing good performance, better performance than conventional approach, it won't fly, okay? So you really need to factor the training overhead into account. The second is that, I mean, re recurrent neural network promise time, process time domain data very well and OFDM data sends in the frequency domain. And you really need to look at how we can do time and frequency jointly, right? I mean, so it's time domain and also we have frequency domain. So you need to combine domain, combine domain knowledge. And third so challenge is that various environment change dynamically over the time and a neural network model needs to be sophisticated enough. If you look at challenge one, challenge three, they are kind of contradicting with each other because if I cannot have too much training, then the neural network shouldn't be too complicated because it's too complicated, you're going to have overfitting. But on the other hand, okay, so 
if it's not that complicated, it cannot capture the dynamic over time frequency. So there are a lot of challenges, let's say, over here. And uh, just for your information, so this is a CIS, common reference signal actual pattern of um, LTE, LTE advanced systems. And you can see that the training overhead is relatively small. Okay, so these are the training. These are the, actually the colored uh, re uh, resource elements are the training symbols. And the rest of white ones are actually the data. So they're a clear trade-off, right? The more colored symbols you put, the less actually white symbols you're going to have. There's a clear trend trade-off between training and the data. All right, so this is actually a, a sample of, of the overhead for the Wi-Fi systems. And the, you, this is S, STS, short training sequence, and this is long training sequence. After that, you have pilot, okay, among 48. So you have 48 data subcarriers, and you have four pilot subcarriers. And altogether, you have 64 subcarriers, and 12 of them are known. So this is actually a typical, let's say, pilot or training sequence, training sequence pattern for Wi-Fi systems. So, for both cases, for both wireless systems, you can see the training is limited. And uh, so how to solve those challenges? Okay, so I mean, so in one shot, actually, what we are going to say is that we're going to utilize something called a reservoir computing. And the reservoir computing is actually a recent, let's say, numerology inspired concept for processing time dependent data. And that's why we call it AI inspired, okay? Uh, brain inspired okay it's actually mimic uh, kind of mimic the human brain's kind of function and in reservoir computing uh, it has actually a lot of good features it has fast processing speed and low power consumption and solve complex tasks within linear post processing techniques and uh, so it's also, it can solve dynamic and time dependent and the learning and the prediction all those are tasks it can resolve so what reservoir computing do is that, I mean, if you look at this is a basic structure, which kind of mimic human brain that you have input layer and you have a, something another three layers. Okay, for basic vanilla reservoir computing or echo standard work, let's say we have actually three layers. First layer is input layer. Another is actually dynamic reservoir layer and also output layer. Okay, so the, up, the dynamic uh, reservoir layer is in fact a fully connected recurrent neural network. So that's why it's forced into recurrent neural network, but it's a special case of recurrent neural network. So the relevant computing has actually three areas or three major actually um, uh, technology per se. One is the echo standard work, another liquid state machine, and the third is delay feedback systems. And it has been actually applied in various areas, including speech recognition and the gene regulatory work, and also virtual cortex of a real cat. So these are actually applied in various areas. So what we do is that we apply relevant computing into communication systems, to be specific, we focus on something called echo state network. So what is echo state network? So like I mentioned earlier, so there's three layers. The first is input layer, another is reservoir layer, and also this is actually the output layer. So if you look at these three layers, there are how many actually weightresses or weight matrix of this neural network has? It has four, okay? The first is input layer to the reservoir layer. So this is the called WIN, connect the input layer to the reservoir layer. The second is internal weights, which of the reservoir layer is W. And also the third one is actually the output layer. You can think about this one. So the connecting the reservoir layer to the output layer and also the feedback layer, which is connected the output layer to the reservoir layer. Okay, so there are four layers and internal dynamics of the system. Okay, the internal states is driven by these four matrices. And of course we have the input signal. So if you input signal, let's say S, S is a state and input signal is X and uh, then the output signal is Y. So, sorry, the, the, uh, the input signal is Y and the output signal is X. So it's a little bit different from let's say traditional communication systems definition. So you input Y here and the output is X and this is actually internal state driven by this. And also this is how the output is driven by the internal state. Okay, so this is activation function activation function of the reservoir layer and the activation function of the output layer. So among these four matrices, the interesting thing is that, I mean, only the output weights are trainable using a simple regression method. And all the other matrices are kind of fixed and randomly generated. So what does that mean? That means this weight in input matrix, internal matrices and output feedback matrices, they are actually randomly generated and fixed. And what does that mean? That means actually you only need to train the output layer, which in some sense, right, give you the benefits of having, you can work with very limited training because you don't need to train all the rest 
of the weight matrices. We only need to train the output matrices. All right, so that's actually Echo's network. And if you're interested, probably we can discuss more on why it works. And we have some follow-up papers and understand the theoretical foundation of that. But let's say, let's first state the echo state property. What is echo state property? Echo state property is saying that, I mean, hey, we want to generate the internal states in such a way that it is not driven by the initial input or the initial states, okay? So that means for finite, okay, for these two finite states, and then we want to, we want to make sure it is actually driven by the input instead of by the states. So we want to say as time goes long enough, so these two systems will be actually approximately the same, even though they have two distinct initial states. Okay, so that's the echo state property. Okay, so what does echo state property translate to? The translate to that if you're using 10H as axiomatization function, then it is telling us the internal matrices W. Okay, we want to make sure the maximum singular value of W matrices is smaller than one. In that sense, then the ESN will satisfy the echo state property. Okay, so that is what we used in generating in, in our actually evaluation or experiment. Okay, so now let's having, having realized in this, then let's look at actually how we apply this. So we apply this pattern patterns. These are the actually various pattern patterns we have for a single subframe. So the subframe will extend. So the first, we talk about four TX systems for transmit antenna. So these are the four pilots. We send four of them symbol are completed or consuming pilots. We have A, which is, let's say pilot uh, uh, occupy all the subcarriers, or these are the, actually the comb structure, which is more related to the current actually adopted in the standards. All right, so these are the actual pilot pattern we use, and uh, re remember they are on a subframe basis. They are going to change from one subframe to another subframe. And we developed actually the ESM-based symbol detector, and later on we extended it to buffer-based. I mean, we increase a window and add a window, in the input of the ESN, and then actually that will increase the, the, the memory of the underlying neural network. And this is actually for the SISO case, and later on we extend it to MIMO case. So we have MIMO OFDM, which is a four by four, which is related to the previous pattern, a simple OFDM pattern I, I listed. All right, so this is a result. Let's go direct to the result. What we show is that, I mean, for QPSK signals, and this is my MOFDM systems for transmit antenna. And you can see that, I mean, the, the, the symbol ESM-based approach, which is actually ESM-based approach, is actually outperform, let's say, the LMMSA-based approach. And uh, we can show, actually, in fact, we can show you that the ESM-based approach has less complexity even with LMMSA-based approach. So what is the LMMSA-based approach? You're using linear mean square, minimum mean square error estimator to do the channel estimation. And then you're using that channel estimation to do the actually the linear mean, minimum mean square error-based symbol detection. Okay, so that is what we mean by LMMSC. So if you look at actually, it's in the linear region, how to perform the LMMSC-based approach, even in the nonlinear region, if you can drive your PI into nonlinear region, we still actually performs pretty well. The neural network based approach, the ESM based approach is pretty stable. All right, so this is for 16 QAM. All right, and uh, similar, similar actually, um, similar, similar phenomenon you can see, right? I mean, the minimal, the MMSC based approach actually performs worse compared with actually the, our symbol detection uh, ESM based approach. All right, so further extension is that we further extend it to, let's say the time frequency and deep version of that. So current, previously we're just using a vanilla ESN and we have only one layer. Now actually we extend it to, let's say multi-layers, right? So we introduce actually a time frequency RC, which actually introduce a frequency layer. Like I said, OFDM has time frequency structure. So you want to do the simple detection. You want to do the, let's say, regression at the time domain. And then in the time, in the frequency domain, you can do the classification. All right, so this is actually the time frequency RC. Then we do the deep time RC. We cascade them together in the time domain and we cascade the time frequency. So, all right, so this is the same structure for a subframe. This is per subframe, the structure. And these are the results for spatial channel model, which is um, uh, used in 3DPP channel models. And you can see that now in this time, we're not only comparing with MMSC based approach, we're also comparing with sphere decoding based approach, which is actually close to maximum likelihood performance. So this is sphere decoding based approach, which you are going to use LMMSC based channel estimation. And then in the symbol detection phase, you are going to use sphere decoding. Okay, so if you look at the 
the ESM-based approach compared with sphere decoding-based approach, even LMMSC-based approach, we're beating LMMSC approach in all SNRs. But for sphere decoding-based approach, if the highest SNR comes in, then because in that sense, the channel estimation is pretty good, and we assume it's, no, it's, it's Gaussian noise, right? In that sense, sphere decoding is the actual approach to optimal. That's why you see the performance of sphere decoding-based approach it works very well in the highest SNR region, okay? And then beat our method. But we are not too far off compared with it. And also interesting thing that I mean, if you in further increase the SNR, further increase the input power, then you go into the nonlinear region and then the sphere decoding based approach will collapse. And then while the neural network based approach is fairly stable in that region. Okay. All right. So this is for the case, like I was mentioning, if you look at millimeter wave, we talk about low resolution ADC. And uh, this is where we look at low resolution ADC. If you look at one bit ADC, right? I mean, it's very coarse, okay? Very coarse. And then in that sense, all those, let's say, model-based approach will collapse. I mean, look at sphere decoding-based approach, LMMS-based approach, they're all collapsed. But I mean, neural network-based approach, I mean, especially ESM-based approach, where our computing-based approach is fairly good. I mean, performance fairly good. And if you increase to two-bit ADC, and the same thing, okay? So this is the SNR. In the SNR region, actually, the, uh, the two-bit performs significantly better. And this provides a pretty comprehensive, actually, comparison versus our approach versus all existing other approach, let's say as LSTM, if you're going to just apply LSTM or GRU, those kind of blindly into this framework. And then even though you have, let's say, you're going to have that's 97% of the overhead, okay? That means you're going to have the majority of the training symbol within that OFDM subframe. Um, majority of the symbol within that OFDM subframe is going to use, is going to serve as a training, but still it's not sufficient. You see, the performance is still pretty bad, okay? The BR. But on the other hand, these are the existing, let's say, DetaNet and then MMNet. Those are actually using different, um, based on perfect channel knowledge versus on estimate channel knowledge, you see the performance really, really collapse. Okay, compare with our method, okay? Um, we, can, we, can, we can achieve less than one, 10%, let's say, bit error rate for uh, using, let's say, only 20% of the overhead. This is for four by four MIMO and, and uh, for all four data streams. Okay, so this is, uh, this is actually what we show you about this is online learning. So meaning what happened is that the online learning saying is that, I mean, we're going to have neural network, which is trained on a suffering basis. Meaning once it is trained, okay, for a, a milliseconds, let's say for a suffering milliseconds, and we use the training symbol within that milliseconds to train a neural network. But once it is trained, it will be fixed. It will be used to conduct symbol detection for all the OFDM symbol within that suffering data symbol. Okay, and this neural network will not change over OFDM symbols. Okay, so that means with design, we assume this kind of subframe have the same feature across all the OFDM symbols, which is usually the case, but for high-speed communication systems, that's not the case because they can change even on an OFDM symbol basis, not a subframe basis. So that's why it motivates us to look at real-time machine learning, meaning you want to train the neural network based on OFDM symbol instead of OFDM subframe. Okay, so the neural network weights can update on each of them symbol adaptively, and you can track the dynamic changes, especially for high-speed communication systems. All right, so this is the adaptive approach, real-time learning for Wi-Fi. So this is actually the Wi-Fi uh, pilot structure. So what we do is that, I mean, we just use this Wi-Fi pilot structure as it is. The transmitter side, we don't do anything. So just to use the Wi-Fi transmit structure, what is the pilot there? What is the, uh, what is the training sequence there? We just use this as it is. At the receiver side, what we do is that, I mean, we use those training symbols and pilot symbols to conduct our neural network-based training, and then we're adaptively changing those ways to do the symbol detection. Okay, so this is a USRP-based um, a demo and we set up in our lab and I, I already mentioned to Paramo I have an open invitation to anybody who are interested to visit us and I can show you uh, the demo. So what actually happened is that we can do it on a real time and um, in front of you and we can turn on the machine in front of you. There's no offline training at all. It's real time and online. Okay, so these are the actually showing the performance. So ESM-based approach compared with, let's say, the traditional, I mean, existing, let's say, Wi-Fi-based receiver. So we can see that ESM-based approach is actually beating using the exactly same overhead, exactly the same transmitter. So we don't change the Wi-Fi transmitter at all, just customize the receiver, that's it. That means no overhead, no additional overhead. 
All right, so later on, we also move a step further just to try to, instead of doing it in the GPUs, and we want to do it in, H, uh, we want to do it in, uh, in real hardware, so FPGAs. So what do we do that time? Mean, we, we connect, we port those data from the USRP and put it into a FPGA and using FPGA to, to, to expedite the processing to achieve really real time in kind of hardware. So this is what we set up in our lab. We have USRP for RF transmission and a PC host running Linux and GNU radio, which is controlled in transmission. And then ESA implementation on FPG for simple detection task. So this is what we do. And this is the result we showed. Okay, the result showing actually the hardware-based ESN implementation, of course, is less accurate. It's actually performance worse compared with actually the software-based approach, but not too much. We're using 16-bit fixed point um, I mean, we can further actually reduce to 8-bit, I mean, either actually to optimize hardware a little bit to either actually expedite the process. But I mean, as a starting point, we use a 16-bit and uh, it's shown very good performance compared with, uh, let's say, hardware versus actually software, if you see here. So this is actually what is a software-based approach. And this is SDR implementation for MEMO FDM systems. So we further extend this previous result is for actually the OFDM, so there's no MIMO. Now we extend it to two by two MIMO and then using hardware. I mean, it's, it's much more challenging than we expect, but anyway, we managed to do it. So, and also extend it to multi-user MIMO scenarios. Okay, so this is uh, down in the uh, pandemic, as you may see, this is the floor plan of one of my students, actually. This is actually Donald's uh, uh, dorm and he actually did an experiment in his dorm. And this is the floor plan of his uh, uh, apartment or dorm. So we are able to do the multi-user MIMO and, uh, uh, as well. So some extension, further extension. So we have actually, we extend this work with actually uh, structure information. So as I previously mentioned, the OFDM system, MIMO OFDM system is transmitting the time and the frequency domain. And on the other hand, we can potentially do process in the time domain and also in the frequency domain, we can do classification. The time domain, we can do regression and the frequency domain, we can do classification. Further, we can take advantage of the structure information, which is because the signal you send X is not just X, is not randomly generated, right? It's modulation. We have structure. So you have the shift invariant. So by collaborating with Dr. Li Zhongzhen, and we are actually extending this to the actually this kind of binary classifier, which is the atom, we call it uh, atomic uh, neural network. Okay, so if you're interested, we have this paper and also the conference version in the Arceloma in last year. So what we do is that we take advantage of the time and frequency structure and also take advantage of the modulation structure and come up something called the RC struct. Okay, in the time that we have with our computing, and this is actually, you can see our performance performs very well, even compared with RC net, and which is deep RC, okay? The previous structure, which does not consider about the, let's say, modulation structure. And also we can beat the sphere decoding based approach. And this is actually, um, these are the two uh, results. This is actually for link adaptation. This result is for link adaptation, meaning actually in each subframe, link and rank adaptation, meaning in each subframe, you are going to change link, change modulation and coding strategy and change, change your rank of transmission. This is a four by four, you can transmit rank one, rank two, rank three, rank four, okay? Transmissions in each subframe, you can freely to do that, okay? But no of other neural network based approach on, existing literature other than our work can work, okay? Can work in those scenarios. It's, it's really because they require some kind of offline training and, <laughs> and we are completely on that. All right, another actually sample extension is uh, collaborating with Dr. Robert, uh, Robert Caldebank actually uh, from Duke. And we are extending this to OTFS, which is high mobility, high speed communication. So this high speed is really talk about the speed of the velocity, okay? So in that sense, then other than let's say recursively, I mean, doing your neural network updates that you can also look at the delay Doppler domain instead of time frequency domain or FDM, right? There's a new waveform called OTFS. So you can use it with our computing to have a simplified, let's say, equalizer for the OTFS receiver because you have spreading over the delay Doppler domain that actually requires equalization at the receiver side. So we showed actually that if you do actually the rate of our computing using a very simple equalizer using RC, then you can do very good performance compared with actually the uh, time delay or time frequency domain in OFT, OFDM. So this is actually with summit last year. Oh, summit last month, sorry. Okay, so that's, I think time is up and uh, that's pretty much it. And I want to conclude my talk. And I was saying that, I mean, rate of our computing is introduced to form my OFDM systems. And instead of just conducting channel estimation and simulation, uh, Reservoir Computing allows us to conduct simulation directly. 
And there's some interesting observations. For example, RC-based symbol detector can achieve better performance than LMMSC and even actually sphere decoding-based approach and with less complexity. And also RC-based symbol detector achieve better energy efficiency. And the takeaway that, I mean, combining neural network and learning approach and telecommunication is promising. A lot of opportunities ahead. And if we apply it to relevant